All right. Uh, thank everybody for being here. Um, thank you, Michael Beach and company, for inviting me, though that invitation actually happened um, nine years ago with the Recreational Water Illness Conference that happened. Uh, and over the last nine years, there's been times I've been extremely appreciative, and there's been times I'm wondering, what the heck did I get myself into? So um, the, my involvement in this, and I'll get a little bit of background before I jump into the slides, my involvement in this in really becoming uh, knowledgeable and uh, in some ways passionate about uh, recreational water illness and what it means to our industry started with a Wall Street Journal news article, a little blurb in the Wall Street Journal, uh, and there was something in there about crypto and the effects on potential effect on crypto on recreational water and, and swimming pools and water parks. That article was, was read by August Bush III. Our company at the time was owned by Anheuser-Busch. It was read by August Bush III. He highlighted it. He tore it out. He sent it to the, sent it to the CEO of Bush Entertainment Corporation, the former uh, name for SeaWorld Parks Entertainment, landed on our CEO's desk, and then landed on my desk. And you can imagine, within 24 hours, I was an expert on crypto. Um, it uh, just a very quick learning curve on trying to figure out what the heck this bug was. Uh, you know, that, uh, you know the, went from being a bug to an oocyst, and I felt really smart at that moment because nobody else knew what an oocyst was. Um, but uh, so that was my kind of my introduction to this whole thing. And then at some point in time, Michael Beach uh, reached out to me. Frankly, I'm not even sure how he got my name. Invited me to that recreational water conference in Atlanta. Um, and uh, you know, and I'm going to circle back around to this in the presentation, but. The fact that uh, so many people were invited, myself included, industry, were invited to that conversation. Uh, and not only were we invited to the conversation, but the, the CDC listened to what was being said. Uh, and the biggest message, and my, you know, I was one of the voices in the room, and those that know me know that my, my voice can get rather loud at times. I was one of the voices in the room that advocated the need for a uniform uh, national code. Uh, not quite understanding the CDC and their role and the fact that they can't publish a national code, uh, but they can uh, provide guidance and standards and, and now the model code for, uh, for aquatics. Uh, that was important. Why was it important to me? Uh, we as a company own and operate uh, 11 parks. Uh, water, our 11 parks around the country, not all water parks, but 11 parks around the country. Most of you know them. Uh, Bush Gardens, SeaWorld, the water parks that are out there associated with those. Uh, in those, uh, those 11 parks reside in five states, okay? And I've got seven AHJs that I need to deal with, okay? Well, you guys know, do the math, it doesn't quite make sense, but it's, of course, because at some point, the re some states are regulated at the state level, other states are regulated at the, at the county level. Um, you know, I will tell one brief story of, of uh, you know, another uh, opportunity I had to, uh, to, to better educate myself or, or a realization I need to better educate myself. We had an incident, it's really not important what park, but uh, immediately following the Atlanta incident where the, uh, the very tragic incident where the kids got sick and one child died. Well, uh, the outcome of that, and some of you may remember this, the news jumped on it, as they often do with these stories, and they ran around the country going to local water parks uh, to, do a, to do a story. Uh, at one of our water parks, a, uh, somebody was in our park, reached into a pool, grabs a water sample, puts a lid on the bottle. A lifeguard says, what are you doing? Because he wasn't wearing a swimsuit. He obviously, it was apparent in how he was dressed that he wasn't a patron there to enjoy the day at the water park, though he paid admission to come in. He says, what are you doing? The guy looks around, and he turns around, starts walking fast, and then, you know, hey, excuse me, you know, come, I'll, come back. I just a question for you. Guy starts running. Park employee, natural reaction of everybody is start running. Thank God he didn't tackle him, but he starts running after him. Uh, guy bursts through the exit turnstile, jumps into a news van, and takes off. Okay? We get a call uh, that we had uh, from the news agency that says, we uh, took a water sample from your park, and we had, um, you had high coliforms. I get a call, got to go up and talk to the, you know, I, I, I'm going to be the face of the company. I got to go, you know, I got to be here tomorrow. 
uh, having never gone through uh, media training, uh, I'm, you know, I'm the backroom engineer at that point. I, you know, I'm not a guy you put in front of a camera. Matter of fact, that's the deal I've got with our PR department is keep me off camera and I'll keep, try to keep the camera away from our parks, make sure nothing falls down, falls over, nobody gets hurt. Uh, and so I ended up uh, going up there. We you know, crashed media training at 12 o'clock at night. Uh, and then next morning, I'm, we're talking to the reporter. It was total coliforms. There was no fecal coliforms. We had some, uh, uh, you know, this is back in the day. We had AstroTurf around the pool. It was wet. You know, you put your hand down. There's a bunch of stuff growing in the AstroTurf. It's no surprise we had to total coliforms. We learned a lot from that. We, did, we, we assessed all of our facilities. Uh, as we do more, more often than not now, because there's always ways you can improve your operation. But I'll never forget this. I'm on camera, got a mic in my face, and the news reporter asked me, she says, so, you know, asked me lots of questions, and I'm prepared for every question she's asking me. They prepped me, we went through, you know, all the Q&A of what, what might possibly be asked. Until the moment, the reporter asked me, so, the local county Department of Health, we, at, we called them and asked them when the last time they inspected your facility. And they said they'd, they'd be more than happy to do so, but they haven't been invited out to inspect you. And so they haven't inspected you in at least the last, it was either two or five years. Why haven't you invited the Department of Health out to inspect you? Yeah, you can imagine, I'm on camera, I'm like, it, you, know, you don't prepare for that. I mean, nobody ever thought to, for that to be part of the Q&A. How in the heck can I be in a situation, in a, in a locale where the Department of Health needs to be invited out to do an inspection? Um, needless to say, again, we, I spent lots of time now learning about local code requirements in each jurisdiction and to the nuance of, you know, are they doing inspections? Do they come out and do random inspections? Encouraging our people to build relationships with local Department of Health, invite them out at the beginning of the season, throughout the season, if they're not coming out for regular inspections. Um, those were, you know, so the point of all this is, and, and where I'm going on this presentation, which I'll jump it right into, is, you know, we as a company learned, and we as an industry have learned, that uh, building relationships with Department of Health is important, but also, and the point of this, uh, the, what we're here to talk about is we as an aquatics industry have a real need to, for a unified uh, standard uh, so that uh, it's, um, so we can, we can do better. You know, when we're chasing standards in different locales with 11 parks and seven dur different jurisdictions, AHJs that we're dealing with, uh, you know, I'm trying to write a, a uniform, unified uh, standard for our company. You know, it doesn't, nobody's going to care that, hey, you know, the local standard is X, and I'm operating the local standard, but somebody's going to get a hold of the fact that, yeah, but you're operating to a better standard on, you know, in this other location. You know, if that's a better standard, why aren't you operating to that standard in all your parks? And so we did that. We, had that, we looked through and identified kind of the least common denominator across the board, and then reviewed that and made sure that made sense and established a, co a company standard that, that, uh, that we had. Well, Gosh, it sure be nice to not have to go through that, for there to be a generally accepted standard. Um, and, and I'm representing, I'm talking about myself, and this is, this is personal for me, but I'm not an outlier. This is our industry. We, there's a lot of people out there like us, uh, like Zero Parks Entertainment, that operate in multiple facilities, and there's a real need for a unified standard. Um, you know, how do you, again, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but you know, how do you define safe when the most basic requirements differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction? Um, you know, and you know, the last point about uh, you know, the fact that not all codes are based on sound science. I hope there's not too many code writers in here, but let's be honest. You know, there is things in the code that you scratch your head and you're like, what the heck? What was somebody thinking about? Um, you know, and, you know, it, um, so um, you know, from a risk management standpoint, we talk about um, uh, uh, you know, what's safe, what's not safe, how to define a standard. Um, accidents occur because people aren't trained, but there's no standard for training. So, you know, as an industry, we want to train our people. We want our people to be as, 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 uh, uh, as prepared as they possibly can. It is in our best interest as an industry to provide a safe uh, facility for our guests. We want our guests to have an enjoyable, safe day. Um, and we want to do everything we can, and so therefore there being national standards on, on, on how to train and, what, and defining what's safe and then how to train for that is is uh, is important. 
Um, you know, the last point up here I, I, I bring up about establishing uniform operating standards, it kind of goes back to what I was just discussing, um, free available chlorine limits. You know, 0.6, 1.0, 2 for, you know, for, the, for the minimum. You know, those are, those are numbers that were out there in the codes in various jurisdictions. You know, what do you operate to? You know, if, you know, and, and of course, the, common, the general public and the news are looking at this, they're scratching their heads saying, well, how can, it be, how can there be disagreement on something so basic as what's, what's a safe chlorine residual in the pools? Um, the, uh, uh, you know, you think about this, there's, you know, 50 states and, you know, I'm an owner operator, but there's designers, there's builders, there's equipment manufacturers, there's trainers, uh, and then, of course, the, 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 the public uh, health industry at, at large. Um, you know, I'm, again, I'm talking personally about my experience, but think about the manufacturers out there trying to sell equipment. You know, they want to, you know, no, none of us, let me take a different approach here, none of us want anybody to invest in something that they don't need. The worst thing that can happen is the snake oil salesman comes in and sells somebody on the latest whatever, and they invest those very limited capital dollars. You know, I'm fortunate I work for a large company, but we still have budgets, we still have limited capital dollars, but think about the, the small operators out there that very little money, and they get sold on some technology, and it sounds good, and they've got good data, and, and they talk about these studies, but whoops, they're not peer-reviewed studies, and they forget to tell them that. Um, and so, you know, what ends up happening is, is operators are, 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 you know, reacting to whatever information they have available. Well, as soon as there's a national standard, a unified standard, and everybody's, you know, educating themselves on the same standard, and manufacturers are building equipment, because manufacturers want this. They want a national standard. They want to know what is it I'm trying to do, what's, what, 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 um, what, what parameters are, are, are the operators trying to maintain, because they'll then invest the money, invest the capital in designing equipment, designing ways to make pools safer if they know that the money they invest in that equipment, in those products that they're going to build, the code's not going to change and it's going to be the same code across the country. And hey, that's good for all of us. The more money that's put into investing in new technology and the right technology, it's going to make pools safer, which is what this is all about. Um, the... Um, uh, so, model aquatic health code. We, Michael touched on it. We've uh, we, we worked to develop a model aquatic health code. I've been involved from the very beginning. One of the uh, one of the uh, uh, people on that steering committee that Michael talked about, and now on the on the board for the model aquatic health code, or the conference for the model aquatic health code. Um, you know, I've uh, it's, it's been a long road. Been involved the whole time. Uh, sometimes more than others, they've tolerated the times when I've, I've, I've kind of uh, had to go and focus on other things, but they drug me back in, uh, and I appreciate that uh, because it, it is important for our industry. The Model Aquatic Health Code uh, is there. To, it covers all aspects of recreational water health and safety. Uh, it has extensive provisions, those areas I'm talking about that we need in facility design and construction, operation and maintenance, and then policies and management. Those are the three key areas that the Model Aquatic Health Code focuses on. Um, and it's really about with the CDC support, and the CDC is the one who, who owns it, who publishes is that. And I, we all believe that's very important because of the, the credibility that comes with it. There's, uh, there's tremendous value, and, and they've been a, a, a great partner and leader in this effort. My hat's off to them because, and particularly uh, Dr. Michael Beach, because it's, you know, that force personality and their, 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 their willingness to make this a priority with limited dollars and limited resources within the federal government and within what they do, they recognize this as a, as a priority uh, and it's good for all of us. Um, the, uh, so this, the, the, the challenges going forward, uh, we need to get past some of the history and, and we're going to talk about it because we all know about it and trust me, I hear about it, I hear about it from others in the industry. Uh, VGB and, and, and uh, Americans with Disability Act and, the, and the, the, the changes that have happened, and trust me, you know, we, our company is one that, uh, that uh, is, uh, well, VGB we, we implemented and we took, uh, it cost us a lot of money, a lot of money across, uh, across our company. Uh, and then ADA, we get the lawyers who come in and measure our, 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 our toilet dispensers and, you know, and then file a lawsuit, and we, so we're, uh, all of this have, impacts us. Um, the reason why I participated in the MAC, the reason why I did this was because what we're doing and what we've done is not um, uh, what happened with VGB and not what happened with ADA, okay? 
Um, imagine you know, having a meeting on DGB where they invite all stakeholders in the room and they listen to the stakeholders. And then they say, you know what, before we do anything, we're going to get a team together. And, before, and then we're going to get technical committees together. And then we're going to spend five to six years figuring this out. And then we're going to open up for public comments. Imagine what VGB would look like if that happened. That isn't what happened, but that is what happened with the MAC. The MAC's a model code. It's not a legislative, uh, it's not a regulation. Um, we didn't publish in the Federal Register, and it's not a regulation that, that has been implemented by lawmakers in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, it, uh, it, uh, there's sub substantial input from the public. What kind of input was there on VGB? Congress. Lobbyists was who gave input on that. Um, public comment? Oh, yeah. Painful periods of public comment. Uh, you know what? Yeah, guy in the back of the room. Um, VGB? No. Uh, can it be updated? Absolutely. Conference for Model Aquatic Health Code. We're going to talk about it today. There's a whole process we're putting in place on how do we keep this current? How do we update this? How do we listen to industry to make sure that this, this, this is relevant and, and addresses the needs going forward, not in, 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 in technology and advances uh, that uh, in, in every avenue, avenue, whether it's training, whether it's uh, technology itself, whether it's uh, operational procedures, best practices, all of that, there's opportunities to, to integrate that in future revisions of the, of the uh, model aquatic health code. Enforceable? Here's the other thing. People talk about, oh my God, you've written this code, now we've got to ab abide by it. No, you don't. You can choose to, and we as a company are going to. Um, but it has to be adopted by local jurisdictions. We're hoping it, it will be. Our, our, you know, we didn't do this for just to put something out there and, 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 and check a box and move on. We did this because we want this adopted. But each state is going to adopt it differently. I can speak, as Michael pointed out, I can, I can speak to the fact that the first state has raised their hand and publicly said, New Mexico publicly said, we, are, we will adopt it and we will adopt it soon. We're in the process. Uh, we're thrilled. We hope more states follow suit. But the reality is, is that each state is going to review it. They're going to take pieces of it. They're going to adopt all of it. Um, so there's opportunities for people to provide additional input and additional comment in the process. Um, retroactive, there's very, very limited. We spend a lot of time talking about, I'm not going to go into detail here, but we spend a lot of time talking about what's retroactive. The majority of it, those things that people are scared of, are not retroactive. Okay. Now, again, it can be adopted differently at the state level. To full disclosure, it goes both ways. It can be adopted. The states can decide to make things retroactive that we uh, didn't envision as to be retroactive. We're not recommending a retroactive, but we were very careful and cautious, and there were lots of voices in the room, including industry, that's got to pay for it. Um, and then uh, uh, it applies to design and construction provisions for new and remodeled pools. BGB didn't matter. Everything. And they gave an, an unrealistic deadline, and they didn't care. They ignored the fact that the, the products needed to implement weren't even on the market. We all remember that fiasco. Okay, building trust. Uh, the MAC is a product of strong collaboration among, amongst all stakeholders right from the beginning. I've, I've, I've repeated that uh, uh, throughout my uh, presentation this morning. That uh, was very much the case. Best chance to avoid issue-specific legislation. Think about this. Without the MAC, next time there's an accident, you know, Congress could very well you know, do the VGB uh, thing again. With this... There's an opportunity for Congress to say, or and CDC, to remind Congress that, hey, we have a means of addressing this, and this is addressed. Um, Ten or five? Five, okay. Have, have a means of addressing this, uh, and we're on a two-year cycle, and, and, we're, and there's a whole process to revise the MAC. So if there's an issue, let us address it through this established procedure we have in place. Um, uh, gain trust of industry. I'm up here talking because I'm in, because I'm an end user and I, I have tremendous trust in the process, having been in, uh, in, uh, uh, deeply involved, intimately involved. Um, of the comments, Michael, real quick, back of the room, how many comments came in? 3,407 comments came in. 4, Excuse me, 4,407. He wants credit for every last one of those. 71% of those comments were included in the final version. They, 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 they were, t nobody, rub you know, just said, okay, whatever, whatever, we consider, we consider, we consider. Everyone was looked at, was read, they were pushed back out to experts in, within the industry that participated in the development process, and the code was made better because of those comments. Okay, how often does that happen? Um, strong collaboration, best chance to avoid... Uh, uh, I highlight the 70% there. Building trust. Um, 
Uh, we're building a big hairy coat. It's a runaway train. We're off to a good start. And there's, a, there's this process I keep talking about, the Conference for Model Aquatic Health Code. Um, but everyone understands trust is earned with time uh, and can't be, uh, but can be blown overnight. So we're all sensitive to that. We want to make sure. We had a meeting yesterday talking about, hey, not only are we establishing a change process, but we want everybody to, to give input on what the change process is, not just on the changes, but how, we, how we're actually going to do changes. And so from that meeting yesterday, we're going we're to take all those, all those comments and work that into the bylaws and constitution of the Conference for Model Aquatic Health Code. Um, Michael touched on this. We're working with other code officials. I'm going to pick this up here. Um, we encourage everyone to become members of the Conference for Model Aquatic Health Code. Uh, there's some flyers passed around. Others have touched on it. We're talking about what that means. Right now you get in for free, but there'll be dues going forward. Uh, and it's going to be, message we heard yesterday, entry, price of entry is going to be really low. We want more people. We want to be inclusive. So everybody should be a member of the Conference for the Model Aquatic Health Code. Builds on the spirit of what's happened to date, uh, working with all stakeholders, ensuring everybody is heard, uh, and, uh, and we want support of industry. We want the designers, the builders, the equipment manufacturers, the trainers, owners, operators, municipalities, and public health. We want everybody involved in this process as they have been up to this point. That is what has made the MAC a success, and that's what we need to drive uh, advances in recreational water health and safety. So the, uh, the CMAC needs you. Um, uh, I, I encourage everyone in this room, I encourage everyone in my industry, uh, from the operator operating the local pool to the operator who's, who, like myself, who's operating multiple pools all the way around the country, needs to be a part of the process, needs to be involved in this. And if you haven't been involved to date, that's okay. Jump on board, we'll take the help, and we, fresh blood's always a good thing. A new perspective's always a good thing. So we encourage anybody and everybody to get involved. Uh, closing thoughts, uh, uniform standards based upon the latest science and best practices helps everyone, including owner-operators, resulting in what we all want, the safest possible experience to our guest. I believe that. Down to the bottom of my feet, I believe that, that's, uh, that, that that is going to help all of us and, and create the safest possible environment for our guest. Um, and please join the CMAC to, make, uh, to take an important step towards redefining aquatic health and safety in this country. So that's closing remarks, slide you've already seen, or you're going to keep seeing it. So questions, any questions for me? Unfortunately, I am, um, I've got to get on a plane and head back and, and go do my full-time job, so I'm not going to be out in the hallway later or tonight. So if you have any questions for me, please ask now. Sorry I can't stick around. Is there any questions or comments? Thank you, John. Um, as a state health department, we're going to need you um, and need folks like you to help us uh, convince our bosses to uh, adopt the MAC, um, just like we did with the FDA food code. The, the question I have for you is, um, best case scenario, all, all of the states adopt the MAC. Um, how, how does it feel for you if that gets changed every two years or every four years. You know what? We, we deal with that uh, in... And how, on the, and I guess how is that different than having yeah. different requirements in all the states? It, understand. And, and the reality is, is that each state will change it differently. We talked about this yesterday. We're going to revise the MAC every two years. Uh, states, we, we all know the state processes. Sometimes you know, it's a four-year cycle, six-year, eight-year cycle, and they're not all, all in the same cycle. So the reality is we're going to have different versions of the MAC out there across the country. You know what? I can deal with that. I'll, I'll deal with that because those will be little differences, and we'll track them, and we'll keep And um, that's manageable. I view that as manageable um, versus, you know, the disparity of codes that were out there and, and the fact that you'd have they're, – they're not structured the same. You, you don't know where to go look for information. When I'm jumping from these – across these seven jurisdictions – it, it's very difficult for me to get the information I need. If there's a unified MAC, and yes, it's a different version, and yes, it's changing, um, as long as the changes aren't big and retroactive like VGB, that's okay. We're, we're, we'll embrace that. Any other questions? Is there any other questions for John? 